today's Sound Iron Podcast, we have Paul Koch. He is a film and television composer based in Los Angeles, California. He went to Berkeley, and he is also one half of the neoclassical electronic duo Moonrock. So, Paul, welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. My first question for you is, are you from a musical family, or what was the role of music in the early years of your life? Uh, my parents aren't particularly musical. They're big music fans, but both of their dads, my both of my grandfathers played violin a little bit. My my mom's dad was in a band playing violin. I've got his violin right over here, which is exciting uh, to play. But yeah, I, they were just big music fans. So I didn't have a lot of music being played in the household. We had a piano and I took piano lessons and I just hated it. I would run and hide and try to find places <laughs> where my piano teacher couldn't find me. But then in school, like a lot of elementary schools in third grade, we started playing the recorder and fourth grade, you know, it's time to pick an instrument and join the band. And so that was like the first time that I actually like thought I could play something and I'd have fun with it. And it wasn't being put upon me like the piano was. Um, yeah. I wish I stuck with the piano, but you know, I think a lot of people feel that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was like, I had to pick an instrument for fourth grade and I was like, I want to play the drums. And my grandpa just said, like, no, I don't play the drums. I was like, okay, uh, maybe I'll play guitar. And then there was no guitar in, in our band program. And my band teacher, Mr. Duclo, told me about this instrument called the bass. And he's like, everyone will always need a bass player. Yeah. Um, it's a lot like a guitar. And so I, you know, I picked it up and that's been my instrument. Yeah, my parents were always introducing me to new music. My dad would always give me CDs and be like, it's time. You know, it's time that you listen to this album. It's time that you watch mm -hmm. Animal House. It's time. He gave me uh, a John Paul Jones album. And it was like, this is one of the great bass players of all time. You got to listen to him if you're going to be a bass player. And I was like, John Paul Jones, like the Darth Vader guy, like Mufasa. And it, for years, I thought it was just, it was James Earl Jones was secretly a bass player uh, <laughs> and like it was awesome and had this other life in Led Zeppelin. But yeah, I, I found that out eventually. <laughs> yeah. And then it just went through school. I was in all the jazz bands and all that all through school and kept it going from there. So what was the process getting into Berkeley? Well, I, my high school, I, I grew up in Rhode Island and my high school would always do the Berkeley High School Jazz Festival every year. So I went there every year for four years to compete in this jazz festival. And I was like, you know, this could be a cool place for me, but it's going to be full of a bunch of like music nerds. And I don't know if I want that. <laughs> um, and then I realized that I'm a big music nerd and like these are my people. And so... Yeah. I applied. And when I applied there, it wasn't super competitive. I think it's gotten a lot more competitive since oh, then. Yeah. So it was the only school I applied to. I like realized that there was nothing else I wanted to do and uh, nothing else that I felt like I could do for the rest of my life. So I just applied for it. I, I did a summer program too, like a music engineering summer program. It was just a week there. And that solidified it to me because we were looking at the multi-tracks of Killer Queen and uh, Freebird. And we were just sitting in the studios and we had these practical classes. And that's when I knew like, this is the place for me. I'm going to be happy here. And so I went and I, I like in high school, I wasn't, I wasn't a great student because I just didn't care about so much of the stuff there. And when I got to Berkeley, like I was doing every elective I could, every extra credit thing I could, I just like, I, I, I soaked it all up and I just loved it so much. Every, every bit of it. If I could like stay there and keep doing more and more majors while I was out here working, I probably would, you know, I'd have like 12 majors from there. <laughs> Sounds like a good fit. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so after Berkeley, you moved to Los Angeles. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Right after Berkeley. I moved out here. Yep. So, so how did you get started in, in film composing? Did you take any, any scoring classes or anything at Berkeley or how did you make, like when you made that transition, was it with the intent of getting into uh, film composing or was it just to kind of be in the scene? My initial thought was I wanted to own a recording studio. That's, that was my goal. I was in a ska band in high school and we went to a studio and it was one of the best experiences I had had. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Then when I got to Berkeley, I, you know, found out about the film scoring program. I I took an intro class. Our high school had gone to see John Williams a few times at the Boston Pops. And I was oh, wow. you know, really into John Williams, but I didn't know it was something that you could do. Like it didn't, I, I, did, I thought that it was just these old white haired bearded guys who, <laughs> who did it. And, and I didn't realize that it was a job that like a person could have. Mm -hmm. um, 
So at Berkeley, that's when I, I found that I took the intro class there and I loved it. And I realized that being in bands and having recording studios, you so often have to rely on other people to like show up. And I had a lot of trouble with that in bands, just like getting people who wanted to do it as much as I did. Mm -hmm. And then this was a way that I could write music by myself and um, hopefully then eventually collaborate with people. But at the time, it was something that I could do and I could make a whole song all by myself with all sorts of instruments. And I learned about samples and stuff. And so at some point over the course of Berkeley, it flipped and I was like, I want to be a composer. I don't want to open a recording studio. I think I kind of saw the writing on the wall with home recording growing so much and yeah. it'd be either like you're recording at home or you're in a big studio and the kind of mid-level studio was not dying out, but really that business was slowing down. And so I saw more of a future in writing music. And so that's what I, I fell in love with and I started to pursue that. How did you, I saw that you were a studio intern and then also a uh, composer's assistant. How did you land those gigs? Yeah, out of Berkeley, I joined their like internship program because they've got an LA internship program. And a former student named Chris Lord was looking for help for his boss, um, looking for an intern. And so I, through that database, I found him and, and talked to him. And I was like, I don't need this to be for school credit if you don't need it to be for school credit. I just want to like hang around and help you out. And he's like, yeah, yeah I don't care. So <laughs> Uh, it was with the composers John O'Brien and Dave Kushner from Velvet Revolver. That was my first job ever. I, you know, I saw the posting one morning. I met with them. You know, I got an email back from them that afternoon, and the next morning I met with them, and that next afternoon they hired me on. Oh, that's awesome! Um, so yeah, it was just like it was really meant to be. And the studio was a quarter mile from my apartment. Oh wow! Uh, which was just, you know, it just felt right. Yeah, it's um, meant to be. And so that. That job has led to almost every bit of work I've ever gotten because of I've just been in their circle of friends this whole time. I've got kind of two paths. My my cousins are filmmakers, and I've done movies for them, and then um, and then everything through John O'Brien and Dave Kushner. Since then, just friends of friends of friends of friends has been uh, my whole career. That's cool. Yeah, because uh, on your website, some of the projects listed, it says that you've done like music programming and editing and like score supervision and all this different stuff. And this, these are all just skills that you built up just kind of, you know, wherever there was something that needed help, you would just learn it. Yeah. So the, the, the story is I started working with John and Dave and they were doing a show called Detroit 187 on ABC. It was a cop show with Michael Imperioli. Um, Tessa Thompson was in it in one of her like early roles. And they, by like the fifth or sixth episode, they had me writing little stingers and little like, you know, dead body sounds when you <laughs> see the dead body and you need just like a very forgetting Sarah Marshall. Um, <laughs> and so I, I was doing a little bit of that, but they were in this building. It's called Hollywood Sounds in Hollywood. And John had moved in. And as each other person moved out, there are a bunch of different editing suites and composer suites and studios in there. It used to be Rick Rubin's place. It's got a long history. That's cool. Every time someone would move out, he'd call his buddies and be like, Hey, there's a space opening in the building. By the time I got there, the entire building was just his friends. Every person in every studio is one of his friends. And they were all different things. There was a, a drummer and a keyboard player and a producer and a songwriter and a drum and bass producer. Everybody was in this one building. And anytime they would need something, if we weren't busy, John would say, oh, take PK. He can, he can help you out. And so cool. I got a ton of experience in all different things there, just doing like tech work or um, doing some like drum editing, like uh, uh, fixing timing on drums or editing vocals and tuning vocals for whatever artists were coming through. And they would pay me, which was great. And it would just yeah. become like uh, this this big circle of people. Anytime they needed something, they'd just be like, hey, PK, do you have a, an hour to just run Pro Tools with me? Because I got this vocalist coming in. I want to be fiddling around with that while I do that. And so I got to know all these people. And then sadly, after about a year, John O'Brien passed away. Very suddenly, very tragically. Um, and so I didn't know what to do. I, I had thought I had found like my guy that I that I was gonna work with for a decade. We were really close, we we got along really well. Hmm. Um, but after you know, a couple months after he died, I got a call from the drummer who lived in the building, Victor and Drizzo, and he said, 
look, my friend uh, Lyle Workman is is getting really busy right now. He's looking, you know, I kind of convinced him to get an assistant, bring somebody on to help him out because he's just like, he's slammed. And if you're interested, you know, would you want to meet with him? And I said, yes, absolutely. You know, I'm looking for something. And so I met with Lyle and uh, we got along really great too. And so that's where I got a lot of you know, I'd done the TV intern stuff. I'd done the like record business stuff. And then he was doing big movies. And so I got to see how orchestration worked in, in real life and mm-hmm. how how scoring sessions worked and how just like a major studio film is put together. So that's how I got kind of that side of my education. It was like Berkeley part two and three and four. You know, I I, I did the schooling, but then you get the real the real world experience, which is just so much more. Yeah. What are some um, things that, that you learned doing that? Like, like things where you had like big revelations of like, oh, wow. Okay. Like, you know, you're going in, you're doing stuff. And then like things that happen that were real big, like learning experiences. You know, at Berkeley, you learn the like ideals and you learn the perfect ways to do things in a perfect world. A lot of the time it's like, you know, you're going to have this big budget for an orchestra and your name is John Williams and you, this is how movies are made. And there's rules, you know, you learn rules because it's school. You got to learn guidelines. Uh, yeah. That's that's how Textbook. education works. But then I got to the real world and I realized there's not a lot of John Williams scores being written right now. Not especially not on television because there's no time, there's no budget. And there's like rock music, there's funk music, there's some sort of hybrid of all these things. You can have strings with drum machines. It's just like this, this style of music that I didn't realize was so prevalent and that you know, there's so many guidelines you learn about, you know, parallel octaves and, uh, you know, all this stuff that doesn't matter at all. Um, mm-hmm. I, I also majored in engineering when I was at Berkeley. And so you get very strict about like how to use your EQ and how to get the best, you know, uh, compression ratios out of stuff. And then you realize that none of that matters. You know, you, <laughs> as long as it sounds good, it's good. You can break all the rules. It's, you know, it's nice to know what the rules are, but you can break all of them. and mm-hmm. and you can layer things that aren't supposed to be layered and you can have an EQ and then a compressor, then another EQ and then another compressor and then a reverb and then an EQ. And if it sounds good, (laughs) you know, who cares? Um, Especially when you're on your like, you know, fourth version of a Q in like the sixth episode. And, you know, you keep on making these little adjustments to it. It can be easy to just plop another EQ on and and go. Mm -hmm. So that was a big revelation for me too. You know, you know, you don't have to use things the way that they're intended to be used and you don't have to, right? Like John Williams. And most people don't get that opportunity. And then the other thing was just like all that attention to detail that needs to happen. You realize how important a lot of the things are, especially when it comes to like orchestration, because there's a lot more rules there. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with a bunch of people and a big budget, you know, you're dealing with 80 musicians on a scoring stage, things have to be perfect. And you, there's not room for error there and you don't get to just kind of say whatever goes, goes. And so, you know, you, you learn a bunch of best practices there on how to how to deliver and how to make things so perfectly clear that nobody will have any questions and you won't waste 10 seconds of this very expensive time. Oh, yeah. um, so that was a big learning experience too. Yeah, it's crazy because like in those types of situations, yeah, 10 seconds is that's a lot of money right there. You know, it's like it, it adds yeah. up over time and like all the time is really like focused probably towards like the score prep and having all that stuff ready for them like that's seems like that's where a lot of the stress would probably be like yeah a big mistake i made once was um we were delivering all of our cues to our orchestrator and they didn't all start at bar one or bar zero you know they started at different places depending on whether there was a pickup or whatever and what i thought would happen is that we'd send it all the orchestrator he'd do his orchestration we'd come back and if he had it listed as bar zero then i'd go in i'd fix the pro tool sessions and stuff But then it just, it adds this whole layer of confusion to it. And he called us. He's like, all these things are different. I've got so many questions. Every queue have a question. Does this one have a pickup? Does this one start at bar two? Does this one start at bar one? And uh, that that was like a big thing where I was like, okay, when I'm sending things off, they have to be so clear and so perfect that nobody's going to have a question about anything. Mm -hmm. And, And yeah, everything will just go as smoothly as possible. Yeah, it's like the over explaining is almost more more necessary. It's kind of like, you know, like sending emails to people like, yeah, you could just like say that, you know, yeah, they'll probably figure it out. But it's like if you just like clearly lay it out, like more than likely you're not going to get a response. And that's probably fine. You know, so yeah, it's just like yeah. that whole like over communication is definitely a requirement, I would think, in in your field. Yeah, it's like when you deliver audio files, you know, you have the time code in the file name, you've got 
it time stamped properly. You might have a, you know, a two pop or a little dialogue slug in there. So that way there's, you know, and you deliver in a pro tool session where everything's lined up. So that mm. way there's four different ways that, you know, everything's in exactly the right place. Mm. Um, and if any one of those things is off, then you can, you know, figure out which one's right. That's really cool. So what was, what was like the, the first big uh, film score that you did or the one that you were kind of like, was like yours and you got to just really show what you could do. Good old Frida was a big one for me. Um, that was right around the time I was working with Lyle and it was a friend of mine uh, uh, recommended me for it because he knew how big of a Beatles fan I was. And it was a documentary about the Beatles secretary, Frida Kelly um, and her time with the Beatles. And, and my first thought was like, you know, awesome. It's the Beatles, the, anything involved with the Beatles I'm, I'm in. But then it's like, you know, how good can a story about a secretary be you know, uh, about the Beatles? And then I watched it and it was incredible. It was like, she's got such a compelling story. But the challenge was the entire movie was tempted with Beatles songs. Right. And we all know how expensive Beatles songs are. They're not going to get Beatles songs in the whole movie. They got four of them, actually, which was incredible. And it was one of the first, maybe the first independent film to license Beatles songs. Because the two surviving Beatles and then the estate to the other two love Frida so much that they said wow. okay to it. But that was a big one. That was like my first real movie. It felt like my first real movie um, mm. that I did on my own. And, you know, I had musicians play on it and we got to write a lot of cool kind of Beatles-esque music for it. And so that one was like, that felt really close to home and something that I, I I would have loved to do. And the filmmaker has gone on to do incredible things. He's like one of the best documentary filmmakers out right now. And he's, he keeps getting Emmy nominations for all the different docs he does They're there. It's great. Um, really cool. And then the next one was a show called lucky seven. That was my first like TV break. It was again, through a friend of John O'Brien's. He was a music supervisor on that show, Detroit 187 that we worked on. And the music supervisor, I'd been helping him out with some tech stuff over the years. And he saw that I had done good old Frida. And he's like, you know, I got this show. Uh, my friend is the showrunner and I would love some help on it if you want to help out. And uh, so I said, yes, you know, whatever I can do, anything, uh, anything I can do to help, I will. And he's like, well, you know, I'm uh, at the time he was doing Sons of Anarchy. He's like, I'm busy with Sons of Anarchy. I would love if you could like really write music for it too. And let's just split it. And I was expecting some sort of ghostwriting situation or additional music situation, but it wasn't. We just split it. We were co-credited. We were, we, you know, everything was, was split. And so I was like, so thankful to Bob for taking this shot on me. At this time, I was like 25, maybe 24. And the show was, it was on ABC. It was produced by Steven Spielberg. It was like a big deal. Yeah. I was like, this is it. I've made it. You know, I've gotten <laughs> my big break and, you know, this will go for 10 years and I'll be set for the rest of my life. Uh, it's going to be amazing. And uh, so that lasted uh, eight days. The show Oof. got canceled the day after its second episode, uh, um, which was heartbreaking. It's yeah. a record breaking show, though. It was at the time ABC's lowest rated fall premiere of all time. I think it's since been surpassed. But yeah, it was such a fun show and such a good experience. We made eight episodes. And I think they're out there, but only two actually aired on TV. Uh, um, but that was like, you know, that's where the imposter syndrome kicks in, but also the the pride of like, I'm doing, this is a real TV show. This is like, you know, it's a, it's an ABC network primetime show. I've made it. But, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I mean, it's like, the next one. yeah, regardless, I mean, you got to apply some real world experience to a fully, you know, TV production. So I'm sure it's like, regardless of what happened, like, I'm sure you learned a ton of stuff just oh, so just much, going through so the much. motions of that yeah having to write that much music in that amount of time you know we had a week an episode which now i see is kind of luxurious but you know we were writing we weren't reusing that many cues so it was really a full episode every week for two months um yeah. and so yeah it was it just having to work under that schedule and being responsible to write the music, not just a dead body sting here and there, mm -hmm. but the, the the score and come up with the themes and the sounds of of the different characters and all that was huge. I mean, that's one of the biggest learning experiences I've ever had. 
Yeah. Did you guys get to work with any any live players for that? Or was it all sort of like you guys doing all the music yourselves? Uh, we did a little bit. So um, Bob would do sessions for Sons of Anarchy all the time. And every once in a while, he'd sneak something in um, to, you know, to a session when when we could and we had extra time. So for the pilot, we did some live drums and we got uh, we got some slide guitar put on it. And we did some recordings there. And then I had my friend Scott, who does uh, he's my counterpart in moon rock and he, i had him come over and just record a bunch of samples for me just like little hi-hat loops and just cymbal sounds that i could reverse and he's a great drummer and so just kind of playing around with instruments and little shakers and stuff so i'd have a, a library to play with that was custom to uh custom to the show mm -hmm. and i still use some of that stuff now after yeah. all this time so uh, it, it really came in handy yeah, but so, most of the, we just had that like initial drum session and then sampling sessions, but week to week, unfortunately, it was just us. But we both play guitar. Bob plays the keyboard pretty well too, and and so we had some of that um, live liveness in each episode. How did you get into making your own contact instruments? Since uh, I saw on your website, you you actually give some away. They actually sound really cool. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, yeah, just curious how you how you started doing that. I well, the, I mean, the stuff with Scott for Lucky Seven was one of the first sampling things I did I had done I had done a little bit for Lyle Workman too just little percussion instruments in his studio and he was such like a proponent of live playing he'd have a musician in every night you know if he could um, we mm -hmm. always had drummers coming and stuff but just for like little percussion things so he wouldn't have to go back into his live room and record the same shaker um, you know or the same little instrument he could play it and especially he had this set of tongue drums and they were all a little bit out of tune and you needed three or four of them to have a chromatic scale. And so that was like one of the projects that he tasked me was like, can you make this into an instrument? So it's in tune and it's playable. So I started to learn how to do that. Um, I borrowed, are you familiar with the Mike Novi scripting book for contact? It's got this woman mm -hmm. with no pants on, on the cover for some reason. <laughs> um, I think it was like a stock image of like woman with laptop, but she, yeah, no pants. <laughs> um, but it's like a great book. It's totally out of print now. If you want it, it's way expensive. But the, I learned scripting through that book, basically. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit through just like the contacts manuals, which are good. I think if you can find the contact three manual, it's a lot. It's got a, a much more in-depth scripting thing than any of the later ones. But yeah, I just so I just started learning it and through through trial and error. Then another composer I worked with a lot, Chad Fisher he always loved having new sounds. And so with him, that's where I really dug in and, and started learning how to sample. And we did a lot of sampling sessions before every season of Scandal. We would do a couple of days where we would just record tons of different things, uh, hand percussion and drums and, and uh, guitars and bowing a vibraphone and turning that into instruments and all the little toys he'd had around his studio. And then he, he came up with this idea I can't remember exactly where it started, but to make an instrument kind of like a Swarmatron, mm -hmm. uh, cause he, I think he had bought a Swarmatron at one point and ended up returning it, um, after the social network came out and they were really well-known and popular, but they're just so expensive and they take up a lot of space. And so he was like, you know, can we make something like that just in software? And so we opened up Omnisphere and I just kind of got I filled up all the layers with uh, as many different string samples as I could find in Omnisphere and then had them, if you move the mod wheel, just detune from each other, just like the Swarmatron does. And that became really cool. And we put a couple of other sound sources in it. We did a horn one and a synth one. But at that point, Omnisphere, you couldn't import your own samples into it. So we were just limited by whatever samples were in Omnisphere. And there's only so many strings uh, that that won't phase with each other because they're the same recording. So that's when I decided I could try to do something in contact with it. And I I had done this these scores where I had used eboed guitars and I do a bunch of layers of them and I just slowly kind of with a slide just kind of bend around the pitch and do the same thing. It was kind of creating the same thing where sometimes they're in tune and then they'd split out and come back together depending on what was happening in the scene. I was like, that's something that I can make in contact. So I did kind of a test version of it and it came out really cool. And it was a small little instrument. This is also the time that a uh, piano book had come out where people were sharing a bunch of free samples over there. And I was like, well, maybe I'll give this away and see what, see what happens. And it, it went over well. I made a YouTube video about like the creation of it. And I, I put it on my website and I put it on piano book and people really liked it. And I was like, well, maybe I'll stick with this. And I'll make some more based on, I had a bunch of ideas. So I did another one with, I've got it two clarinets for some reason. I don't play the clarinet, but I've got 
two of them. So mm-hmm. I was like, this would be a cool one too. And I think that one became my favorite. It's just eight or 10 different clarinets that again, spread, spread in and out with each other. And I did another one with a bunch of acoustic instruments that are around some of these guitars and a dulcimer and yeah. a banjo and stuff. And so, yeah, it was, it was something that I would have loved to have if, if it didn't exist. And I think those are kind of the best things to create. It's like, I could do this with guitars and it would just take for a while, oh, forever and just set it up. And, and you can spread a lot farther than you can with a real guitar if you're using a sample. Mm-hmm. And I'd done that also on a, on a movie called the block Island sound. I was doing a lot of those textures in that too. And I did it with the violin as well um, with the live violin. And I just recorded a bunch of layers on top of each other and, ha- and I, I'm, I cannot play the violin. So just by nature of my skill, it was sometimes in tune and sometimes way out of tune. Um, and that came out really well. So that's actually, I've been working on that too, doing one with all strings uh, mm-hmm. will be the same kind of thing. It's kind of in like a, there will be blood, Kind oh, of yeah. or like the thx sound you know it's it uh yeah, with like but a there will be blood has a lot unison. of that too yeah yeah so that's that's another one that i'm working on but yeah it's it's just they're they're fun to do and they're they i find them really useful especially if you only use them like 10 percent of what they can do just to have like like you're detuning a synth you know just like a mm-hmm. little bit of detune but having these organic you know acoustic textures i think is really um adds another layer to it yeah, that's what I thought was really cool about about the, your virtual instrument is how like when you have that knob and it, like it kind of goes like in and out, it, like it just like all of a sudden it's just like automatically adds like cool vibes. Like it's just yeah. it's like, just like, uh oh, like <laughs> something, <laughs> so, something bad is going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah, you can use just a unison high string, you know, and, and uh, it sounds nice and pretty and not do anything. But yeah, when that bend happens, you know, something's something's coming. Yeah. Um, did you use any of this kind of stuff on like the 13 camera score? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, that one, I used a slide guitar um, oh, okay. and I was doing the same thing. So I, I was pre uh, pre Dunkirk, but I was doing a lot of shepherd tones in that, mm. in that film. Uh, so I would just keep recording a bunch of versions of me with the Ebo and the, and the slide guitar, just slowly sliding up. And that one would fade out as the next one faded in. And it created, you know, this just constantly rising, uh ebo guitar sound and that would continue for four minutes just always rising there's other stuff going around it but you you feel this really slow tension always rising Mm -hmm. but it never hits the top of the barber pole because some other thing is is swooping in so i did a lot of that and then on uh, a day to die the recent movie that i did i did a similar thing again but with chugging electric guitars like uh palm muted like dun, 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 dun. Mm-hmm. and it was the same thing i just did like 30 of them and then there's i'm slowly bending them in and out so that way you know it's some big action pulsey chase scene and when things are going kind of normally they're in tune with each other but then they start to kind of splinter mm-hmm. and so i tried doing that in contact but contact can't handle that many instruments tempo synced at once bending in and out of each other so that was kind of a failed experiment on the contact end uh, um, but it was it worked really well i think for the film yeah that's, that's really cool yeah, i was actually uh watching that recently oh thank you for checking it out yeah the man that 13 cameras movie ugh, that's just a, a scary thought <laughs> like like that's yeah. something like that stuff like that does happen now, i mean the dude's all the dude's a pretty creepy dude but i'm just like yeah Man, yeah, that yeah, I saw both. I saw the 13 cameras and the 14 cameras, but yeah, it was just like, ugh. yeah, it's it's like, uh, you know, they kind of wanted it to be the jaws, you know, a new jaws where there's this real thing in your life that you're afraid of. You know, people mm-hmm. after jaws came out were afraid to go in the water, and uh, after this movie came out, you know, the, the filmmakers they're my cousins, Matt and Kevin McManus, and they it was just kind of the same thing. They when they wrote it, they they wanted it to be that, like, anytime you're in an Airbnb you're kind of looking around a little creeped out by it. Um, and, you know, I've got this camera right here. I've got a little cover that I put over it, you know, and I don't think that was as popular 10 years ago with webcams and stuff. You know, they mm-hmm. use kind of like the tinfoil hat. People would put a little piece of tape over it, but now I'd feel weird not having it. <laughs> but yeah, I was really creeped out by those movies too. That was one where they sent it to me and I got it. Like I was still asleep in bed. I got the email and like, Hey, we just like shot this film and you know we'd love for you to see it and see what you think and i was like oh i'll check out like five minutes of it while i'm in bed and then i ended up just watching the whole thing on my phone uh because i was just so entranced by it by the whole thing it yeah was, uh, it was a fun project to be a part of and 14 cameras too is uh cool to see again with the dark web how it can kind of progress from one guy in his creepy shack watching a bunch of people in his house to uh 
you know, selling it and then sneaking into the house to try to steal items from them to sell them. And oh, it's so creepy. Yeah, that yeah, that's the thing about that. Like when you're like seeing people like grabbing their toothbrush and like yeah. like oh <laughs> oh man, you're like, no, thanks. <laughs> that's the big groaning moment from yeah, he's got a thing for it. When they met the actor, Neville Archambault, they got his like audition tape or whatever, and they're like, mm-hmm. This guy is perfect, but is he like self-aware? Is he is he just like a big creep? Are we gonna let a big creep around our like cast and crew? And they met him and he's like the jolliest, nicest guy in the world. But he just has this look like when he puts on that face and he drops his jaw that you just you're you're just transforms. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's just you're just afraid of him. I met him at the um we premiered at the Fantasia Film Festival in Montreal and I got to spend some time with him. And he's been he's been in 14 cameras. He was in the Block Island Sound as well. Mm-hmm. Um he's just a, a lovely guy who uh, you wouldn't know from watching the movie. Well, it's it's good to know that he he's a nice guy. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you won't have bad dreams about him tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Nobody so, needs that. So a lot of our audience is looking to get that first opportunity. So um, could you give some advice if someone is looking to land a assistant job or a intern job? Like, what are some things that would help uh, you stand apart? I think for me, a big thing that helped me was having the engineering background from Berkeley too, and not just yeah. film scoring. Because when you're an assistant, your job is not to write music. It's not to orchestrate often. Sometimes it is. But a lot of times it's, why is this pop-up coming up? Why is Pro Tools locking up? Why does Logic have this error? Why, like, why is this freezing up? And you have to kind of figure that out. And having a really good technical skill set, I think, is super important. I think you should know your like sequencer in and out because that's how you're going to be most helpful to, helpful to the composer. Anything you can do to let them turn off that side of their brain and write, I think is really important. I think the advice that I used to give, which I don't really like anymore, is, is to just, um, I used to say, because I'd heard it so many times, like don't have a backup plan because then you'll use it, you know, and just like you have to put yourself 100% into this. But I think it's like kind of a privileged thing to say because a lot of times you need to have a backup plan so you can live and support your family and stuff. Sure. Not everybody mm-hmm. has a, a supportive family who can help them out when, while they're trying to pursue this. And I think that the the advice that I hear a lot of just like work hard, always say yes, do everything can't always work because you need to have a job, you know, you need to make money and you can't just throw everything at being there all the time. Mm-hmm. But I think just trying to learn as much as you can, try to be as versatile as you can. So that way, like I did at Hollywood Sound, if anybody needs help with anything, hopefully you're the person who can do it for them. Then it's just like, be cool. Don't be a jerk. Don't be annoying. You know, don't smell bad. Uh, <laughs> just be like the yeah. kind of person that people want to be around. I think yeah. that's, I've been lucky to get a lot of work from people who, I mean, Most of my work has come from me just helping somebody install a piece of software or troubleshoot something, or um, it's usually been some sort of a technical thing. And then eventually they're like, you write music too? Like you scored this film? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I do. And like, I I don't usually bring it up because I never want to feel like I'm pitching myself and like I'm there for the wrong reasons. Like I'm here to help you. And that's why I'm here. Um, I just want to be that guy that people call when they have questions and i think that's helped because i've seen a lot of people be really pushy and be like Mm -hmm. i'm a composer let let me help i could do whatever you want i'm the best you know and and (laughs) i think that just do you want that person in your studio with you maybe sometimes but i just want somebody who's like cool and who i can bounce ideas off of and who i can chat with and um i try to be that person for other people too and i still do it you know i it's i think it's the kind of job where you just don't want to have an ego about it and yeah. um even when i'm doing you know i'm in the middle of doing music for a cool movie with bruce willis or i'm doing you know whatever if somebody calls and they're like i'm having this like problem with my computer like i i want to be able to help you know cuz these these are my friends these aren't just like my excel document of people in the industry you know so i think that's it i think it's like know your stuff be really good at you know as much as you can know and just be Cool. That's good advice. Um, yeah. Could you share some insight into your creative process, like how you typically start a new project? Uh, I start with fear, usually. <laughs> um, nice. I mean, I suffer from imposter syndrome, like a lot of people. I do a lot of listening. I try to do a lot of research. When I started A Day to Die, I wrote a demo for it. I was lucky to get hired for it. And then they hadn't even shot 
the movie yet. So I had a lot of time to prepare. And so for that movie, I was like, I'll put myself through action movie school. I'm a big action movie fan. You know, I love uh, the Bourne movies and the James Bond movies and the John Wick movies are amazing. I was like, I just want to just get the broadest understanding of this genre because it's just, it's a genre film. You know, it's mm-hmm. you can tell what a lot of Wes Miller, the director's um, influences are and what movies he loves by watching this movie. And it's, you know, it's an original piece, but it's got, it pulls from the genre. It's a genre movie. And so I wanted my score to do that too, where it's, it's not something completely out of the box. Cause it shouldn't be. That's, that would be kind of a, a selfish thing to do. I, I thought it would best serve the movie is to just do like a really great score within the genre that pops out of the box at certain points, but stays in when it should. And so for three months, I think, uh, every night after my, my son and my wife would go to sleep, I would just put on a movie, some sort of an action movie, one of the greats, um, one of the, something really recent or something like a real classic and just watch it and not try to like pull any real specifics about it, but just kind of by osmosis absorb all of all these different films. So that was like, that's one part of my process. And then I just like to sit in front of the keyboard with some sounds up and the movie and just noodle. I, I'm not so much of like a conceptual person like, Oh, well he, you know, this character loves to wear blue and this instrument used to be blue, you know, whatever. Like I think people get really into the weeds about some of that stuff. And so I just like to see what feels right and just play a bunch of stuff and try different things out. Sometimes even throwing temp music against it. um, If the temp that's in there isn't really doing what it needs to do. Mm -hmm. I like to just try stuff and I like to start from the beginning of the movie almost almost always and just kind of experience it through the movie just like the audience will and then I'll go back and add some things if it makes sense to uh to something that I discovered in the third act to bring back into Mm -hmm. the first if it makes sense but like on a day to die I wrote the prologue first and it didn't really change much at all since then Mm -hmm. and that had themes for all the characters and it had uh that was where the entire sound palette came from and then that I was able to apply to the whole the whole rest of the film. I do like to do like a sampling session, just like some sort of a playing around coming up with sounds. I've got like a few toys over here that I can just hit record and play them and then turn them into loops and and samples and contact. That's another just way of getting my creative juices flowing and kind of procrastinating, actually writing notes. Um, (laughs) Just playing around, coming up with like ideas and sounds and, and seeing what weird it sounds this Lyra eight makes. Cause that's always surprising. Cause I don't know how to wrangle it. And so, yeah, just come up with a bunch of sounds and, and see what I can figure out from there. And then a lot of times that's what sparks a cue, you know, you, yeah, I'm sure, you know, like you're, when you're digging through presets, you hear a preset, you play something, then you get another preset, you play something completely different. Cause it just kind of like sparks you in that way. Yeah. And so if you're able good. to do that with your own instruments, then um, you're, you're in really good shape. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Cause I've heard people say that, Sometimes they'll write a theme from like a really soft moment in a movie that will like later, you know, like maybe earlier in the movie is a little bit more intense, but then it's kind of leading toward this, you know, sort of like softer moment or something. And they'll end up like starting from there. So it's it's really cool to hear the concepts of like how sort of certain themes are crafted from, you know, because it's not always from like the big huge moment in the movie. It could just be from like, like some small little thing like, oh, like, you know, just because you're experiencing it. A different way or and you know i think that's cool like how themes are crafted from spots that maybe people didn't think about yeah sometimes it's not the part that you thought was going to become a theme it's just like a little you know counter line and then you're like oh well, if i take that and then i extend it and i can make it grow then that could actually be a theme on its own that's happened a lot mm-hmm. i'll take just a, i'll turn a fragment into a theme rather than taking the big theme from the end and breaking it into into little fragments what were some of your favorite action movies you watched in your research the John Wick movies. I love the John Wick movies. There's like a cartooniness to them that I just love. You know, there's, there's, you know, the scene where John Wick and common are, are just shooting each other in a crowded place with their silencers on. And uh, in the real world, people would probably hear a bunch (laughs) of gunshots, even the silencers on, but in the John Wick world, you know, nobody notices and they're just getting shot, but they're being silent about it. So it's all is good. I love it. You know, the fight choreography is just incredible in those movies. I do love the Bourne movies. Uh, you know, Heat, I think Heat was a big influence for A Day to Die, too. Uh, there's a big, you know, bank shootout out in the streets of yeah. Jackson, Mississippi. I think uh, it, it felt like a spiritual successor to Heat in a way. What else did I love? I, was, I mean, recently done my full James Bond rewatch. 
start to finish. Uh, and so those always have an influence on me. And a lot of the diehard movies too. I love the diehard movies. And I was, was going to ask that. I was like, did you did you uh, dig into any old diehards? <laughs> any Bruce yeah, Willis? I did. I did. Yeah. yeah, I did the diehards. Yeah, Th- those movies are just so good. And this, you know, it, just to be able to be a part of something with Bruce Willis in it, you know, I know he's had a lot of health problems lately and that's, mm-hmm. that's come out recently, how much of a struggle it's been for him to act, but to be a part of like that legacy of the guy who was in these movies was, was such a huge honor for me. Um, yeah, super cool. Yeah. I mean the, the, yeah, the diehards when I went through a breakup and my sister, my older sister was like, okay, I'm going to send you a care package. And this is what you do when you go through a breakup. She sent me brownie mix and a mug to make brownie ice cream. And then she sent me Die Hard and The Italian Job. She's like, you got to watch action movies while you eat this like brownie uh, ice cream <laughs> mix. And uh, so I always like have that recollection when, I, you know, that memory every time I think of these movies is like uh, my sister, you know, taking good care of me. And this is what you do when you're uh, upset. You take solace in action movies. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good sister yeah oh yeah she's the best she's the best she got me into a lot of music too like pop music jazz music so my my parents this kind of call back to the earlier question but my parents would always introduce me to music and the beatles and stuff and then you know my parents are my parents but my sister my older sister was the coolest person in the world you know i wanted to do everything that she wanted to do so whatever made it from my parents to my sister and stuck that like had an extra importance to me um she went through a big beatles phase and uh so i went through a big beatles phase you know that for me it's never ended but then she also was really into ska she was really into real big fish and uh, the hippos and uh a bunch of these bands that um she kind of went through a little phase and i didn't i loved it and i was in ska bands in high school and college and uh, i just recently mixed a ska song and i recently played a guitar on a score for a friend who's doing a ska thing it just never you know it left me for a little while but it's part of my my musical journey and yeah, uh, like a- that comes like through my parents through my sister and that's when you know you get the you know it's legitimate like kids cool kids like this so I, i'm gonna mm-hmm. like this too and i sure did did you watch get back on disney plus i haven't finished it yet um, okay. i've watched uh, a good amount at this point uh, george has quit and yep, uh, yep. where i'm at but yes yeah, that movie was incredible it's something that i just have to like sit and watch you can't be on your phone you can't like <laughs> have anything else to do you just have to sit and experience it and like be in the room with them but yeah i loved it, it just seeing uh seeing the song get back be created in front of you was such a cool thing as someone who writes music to see it come from the seed and you can recognize it but nobody's paying attention to him same thing when he plays uh i think it's let it be and he's just playing this song on piano and people are just walking by and you're like, you're witnessing history right now. Everybody should pay attention to him right now. Uh, but at that point, it's just, you know, some simple chords and you don't realize what it's going to become, but then it becomes let it be. It's yeah. It's such a cool thing that I've never seen that from that perspective before. Yeah. I've been that, trying to get Craig to watch it, but so far we're having trouble. So Craig, Paul yeah. says you should watch it. I know I have a huge list of things that I need to watch. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's funny because I remember when you're talking about the George Harrison thing, he was just like, I, I quit or something like it's like it's just yeah, super like nonchalant. Yeah. yeah think, it's like, uh, well, yeah, I'm uh, I'm out of bands. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. <laughs> and you see that like bubbling up in him. There's a bunch of close ups on him while the other stuff is happening. You just see him just like getting more and more like frustrated. And you can tell it's all coming up. And he's just like, all right. Yeah, he's just having it's this, it's like, a cool moment. Yeah, that, that's the thing I miss about back in the day, like, you know, playing in bands, like just sitting and just kind of noodling with your friends and like, hey, what was that? Like, what was that little thing you did? Like, yeah, like that, like I miss those days. Like, that's when it was fun. You know, like, I mean, it's it's always fun, of course, you know, just being in your studio and just kind of, you know, working on ideas. <laughs> sure. But but it's it's cool to just kind of see everyone's wheels turning and like you know oh what's that and then build off of that those are the good old days that's why i started uh to do moon rock with my friend scott you know we wanted to do something together we wanted to do something where we didn't have to have it have anything to do with picture it could just be wherever you want the music to go it can Mm -hmm. go if you want to go four more bars you can which you can't do in film yeah um if you want to change genres in the middle for no reason you know you can so what we would do is, you know, I'd write something, he'd write something, we'd do a little bit remotely together. And then this was pre-pandemic, we would get together and and that's when the magic would happen. That's when we'd figure out all these parts and Scott would have like just accidentally pressed a sample that was like, doo, 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 doo. and uh, so then he put that in the thing and that became a whole another half of the song that we thought was over, just went for another three minutes because of just mm-hmm. this like one thing that he figured out. 
and yeah, so that, that like magic that you're talking about is, uh, something that you don't get often enough, you know, sometimes you get it when a musician comes in, but usually it's more like, Hey, I wrote this part. Can you play it really well? And they do. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes there's some improvisation there. Uh, but yeah, to be able to like kind of have a band again with somebody who's as into it as you are and, and yeah. you can kind of feed off of each other and like, what was that thing? What was that thing? It's, it's the best. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That was like, that's honestly like one of my favorite things about writing music. I mean, cause it, it's cool when you can be in your own zone and just kind of like not let anyone distract you. And, you know, maybe it might take a little bit longer because you're the one who's kind of making all the sounds happen or cycling through stuff or just trying to get your head in that space. But um, yeah, just the collaboration with other people is always, it's always fun. It, it makes music, uh, you know, just a really fun thing. Yeah. And you only, you, I, at least for me, I make the same mistakes all the time. Like my happy accidents tend to be the same thing. My muscle memory like fails in the same direction all the time. And mm-hmm. so when you're working with somebody else, they're making completely different, you know, accidents and in completely different ways and with different software and they've got a different workflow. So I think like just so, and they've got different brains obviously. And so, so many different things can come out of working with somebody else, um, yeah. even just through the accidents. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I definitely got to watch that documentary, though. (laughs) Could you tell us uh, any tips or tricks you have when you feel overwhelmed or unfocused? What do you do? I mean, you got to leave the studio. That's a big thing. We're so used to being in here all the time, always. The door closed. You know, it's you have to get out. You have to go for a walk, I think, or watch something, but something completely unrelated to what you're doing. Like if I'm stuck in a day to day, I'm not going to then go watch Die Hard because I'm already in the process. I'll go watch some comedy or Mm -hmm. something, just kind of clear the brain. There's a lot of times where I'm working on a cue and I'm trying to figure it out and I can't figure it out. And it's like 3 a.m. I'm like, I'm just going to go to bed Mm -hmm. and figure it out. But then the cue, what I've already written that I don't love is playing in my head all night long. And it's just (laughs) like a loop in my brain. I can't get out of it. And and so I think you need to like cleanse the palate. I think that's a a big thing and try to get Mm -hmm. whatever's stuck in your head out of it because you're just going to keep repeating yourself if it's the repetition if you keep repeating it you're just you're not going to get anything new in your head i think it just gets stuck there so yeah you got to cleanse your palate you got to walk away you got to do something different go cook dinner take an hour off when you're like really in in the thick of deadlines and you feel like you can't take a second off i think if you take an hour off and clear your brain you'll be so much more productive when you come back that you'll work better than if you didn't take a break yeah do you ever have it where you take a break and you're like all right i'm gonna go make dinner i am just you know take a step off and you're cooking and then you're just like oh do you ever just like stop and just like turn everything off and like get an idea and go run back <laughs> yeah. you're like <laughs> yeah I, I figured it out yeah yeah absolutely. like you're just you're just like tapping the spatula on the pan like ding 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 and you're like wait hold on and you're just like just turn everything off like hold on i'll be right back <laughs> yeah I've heard that like uh, people who are um, late all the time, like people who are always late are are late because they're optimistic and uh, it's, they think that they have enough time to do things. They're not trying to be, you know, uh, disrespectful to your time. They just think like, yeah, I could probably get this done before I have to leave. Um, That's me with, with music a lot of the time where like, I'm like, I just, I, I just need to put down this one little thing and then I'll be good. You know? And then mm-hmm. once I finish this idea, then I can go do something. And I do exactly that. I go to cook and I'm like, Oh, let me just put this one more thing down. I run back in here and I'm, I, I put it in and then I go and yeah, it takes me an hour and a half to actually start. <laughs> Everyone's like, Hey, we're hungry. Where's the food yeah. at? <laughs> no more yep. music, Paul. It's just finish this one thing. It'll be five minutes and it's, you know, an hour. I was going to say, I used to do that when I was younger, like when I was like writing music in a band and, you know, I'd go to sleep or I'd try to start sleeping. And then like 15 minutes in, I would be like, oh, like I would, you know, not wake up. I'd be like almost asleep and I wake up and I'd go run and like start like tabbing out some idea because like some little thing popped in my head. And I was like, I know I will forget it. And back then I didn't do like voice memos or anything. I was just like, I need to just go and like play guitar and like figure it out real quick because like I do not want to forget this. Yeah. So it's like, it's like, can't even sleep now. You sometimes get that too, where you've like dreamed up a melody or something, and then you go write it down or you try to do it. And then in the morning you realize how terrible it was. And it was like, just my dream self thought this was amazing, but it is not at all. I've never really done that. Like I've, I've had times where like, I was like either playing music or, or like doing something that was like really, like it felt really cool in the dream. But then when you wake up, like you just completely forgot, like, I'll like, <laughs> I don't even know what it was, but it, it felt really like awesome at the time. Like like some super cool idea but then yeah you wake up and you're just like gone (laughs) i wonder if that idea ever really existed either if it was just like the feeling of 
figuring it out the feeling of having written it yeah it's like an inception where it's like the the details aren't actually there and you just like you know how'd you get here and you're like oh i would just get and they're like oh i don't remember how i got here maybe it's the same thing that the the music was never actually there just the feeling of having written it and the feeling of having listened to it and loved it was there yeah i feel like any music related dreams i've ever had like any i don't know if you've ever had this where like i feel like any dream i've ever had that is revolved around like playing live it's always bad. Like I've never played a good show in a dream. It's always like we're standing around for an hour, like waiting for like there's some kind of technical issue or or something like that. It's just like, or you didn't have time to like prepare or rehearse and you're just like, I don't even know how I'm going to play this song. Like I didn't even learn it. Like it's just like, I feel like it's always just like bad. <laughs> Yeah, I get like a dream paralysis sometimes, like where I just can't, my my hand won't strum. It just won't go there. And I've had like flying dreams like that too, where my feet won't pick off the ground. I'm almost flying, but my feet just won't leave. Um, So I'm dragging on my toes, you know, it's, 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 yeah, I get that. It's it's like a fighting dream where like you're trying to fight and it's in slow motion, like you're trying to play and it's just like, uh, (laughs) not quite there yet. Why is is this taking so long? Um, Could you tell us about a personal project you're excited about? Uh, more moon rock coming up, which is really nice. fun. Um, yeah, we've, we've started, uh, we're very slow at, at moon rock. We started the first album in 20 end of 2014, I think is when we started like putting things together and we put it out in 2019. Um, and it's only six songs. Like we didn't need to take that long with it. And, uh, so hopefully this won't be another, you know, four or five years before this one's out. Uh, we're hoping for something out by the end of the year, um, probably around October, November, and then, uh, more next year, hopefully. So that's something that, that we're really proud of. I love doing that with Scott. It's always like a dream to work with him. And so that's, that's been really fun. Something that I did recently too, that I haven't really talked much about, cause I didn't know if I could was um my friend steven mann and i did some music for the uh galactic star cruiser hotel in florida the oh, star cool. wars hotel oh cool and uh so that's something like i haven't been able to go and experience it yet but we did music for one of the the dinners the, the night two dinner on on the galactic star cruiser where it's a taste around the galaxy of star wars and so through you it's a four course meal and each course you get a little bit of food from a different planet uh, from the Star Wars universe, and it's accompanied by this big presentation and a speech about the the food and where it came from, and uh, and music from that planet. Kind of the idea was um, source music from these planets, like Mustafar and Kashyyyk and uh, Felucia, and what would the music that would exist on this planet be like? It's not at all John Williamsy. It's it's like alien music, which was mm-hmm. super fun to do because you know we do, you don't want any instrument to sound like an instrument from earth, you know? So it was every yeah. sound we were trying to create something unique and create something new for it. So hopefully sometime I'll get to go down to Florida and, and check it out and, and board the, the house on. Um, but that's something that I'm super proud of having done and been a part of the star Wars universe in some way and working with Disney Imagineering and being able to do that was super cool. That's rad. Could you tell us about any of the specific instruments or plugins or techniques that you used for the different planets? Yeah, the um, we used a lot of the plugin Cube. Um, okay. uh, friends of ours developed it, and uh, so Stephen had been using it a lot. He created a lot of the presets for it, and he was involved in a lot of the sound creation and recording. So that was something that we used a lot for just kind of weird sounds because it you can blend eight different sounds together, and it forms this cube. They're like the corners of the cube, and you can morph front and back and left and right and up and down um, oh, wow. to morph between all these different sounds. And it's a really, really cool plug-in. Then there's also a lot, there's vocals. I'm uh, singing as a uh, Twi'lek citizen of uh, Coruscant. Uh, <laughs> and so there's, uh, I wrote, you know, twilek lyrics for it. And then the vocals are tuned and, and weird and garbled and stuff. So there's cool vocal textures. There's, you know, uh, Wookiee sounds on Kashyyyk. There's the idea of Felucia is that it's a very, it's a farm planet there. You know, there's a lot of farming happening. It's very wet and humid and squishy. So we were, we were trying to use sounds that sound squishy for better words. And what does that mean? You know, your guess is good as mine, but we're doing things like um, tablas. There's just a boom of a tabla, things Mm -hmm. that sound like drops of water, things that sound like, like footsteps in a marsh, just like sounds, even (laughs) from my mouth, a lot of that. And then just kind of flutes and, um, you know, high woodwinds also being kind of garbled in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, What else did we use? 
I don't know. There's a lot of just stuff like that, just like normal-ish instruments that kind of feel like they'd fit in a, uh, you know, on an alien planet, but then just kind of garbled in some way, whether it's tuned in a weird way or it's through some sort of a flanger or just anything you can do to make it sound weird. How many minutes of music was it? Uh, it was probably about probably about 10 minutes. So there's okay. like an, an opening and then there's a minute or two for each planet. Um, as they're doing the presentation of like, this is the food and and it has this cool thing. Here's the blue shrimp that you get to eat. Um, and then there's, there's an outro piece too. And the intro and outro piece both have elements of all the different planets, like a suite that goes through very exciting. And it has just like a little taste of this planet, a little taste of that planet and just taking you through the journey in the beginning and the end. I love that idea. That's very creative. It's fun. It's, it's something that I never expected to do is score a meal. Uh, right. of all the things that i've done you know at dinner uh but it was so fun and so cool just to have no there's no picture you know they, we had a recording of what the voiceover was roughly going to be but that was it and just kind of blank page creation was something that uh is intimidating but it was really fun for this project i was gonna say i was really curious as to think of like what kind of food it w- would it be like when you said blue shrimp, I was like, oh, okay, that kind of like answered a little bit of my question. But I was like, or like what I was thinking, because I was like, man, what kind of food like would they make, you know, out of like our food to try to, you know, for another planet or something? There's things like uh, banta ribs, you know, there's so there's a bunch of different uh, things that are yeah similar to our meat, but from another planet, from another uh, species. Um, but you can see the menu online. I, I, yeah. I, the food looks incredible and i would love to taste it you know we we got little bits of what it was going to be as we were working and um and some of the food like transforms in certain ways as they bring it to your table it kind of you know it's in this thing and it opens up and the colors change and uh it's really like a remarkable meal and disney's known for i think having really good food and spending Mm -hmm. a lot of energy and time on it and so uh i is from what i've heard it totally lives up to that and it really exceeds it Cool. You definitely got to go, man. <laughs> I know. I know. I got to go. A special I bring trip. the family. It's such a cool idea. Just like a fully immersive two day stay in this hotel mm-hmm. where it's just like you can interact with all the people around you. It just seems like such a cool experience. Yeah. Could you tell us about a typical day in the life of Paul? Yeah. I get up uh, when my son gets up. So I usually do mornings with my son. He gets up at 9 30. And uh, my wife works early morning. She works at a hospital testing newborn babies hearing. And oh, okay. so her, hmm. she just goes to a bunch of hospitals around LA and she works like at five in the morning, a few days a week. And so I do mornings with my son usually. And then whenever she's run out of babies to test, she comes home and that's kind of my time to get started. Usually it's around lunchtime, uh, but as late as like early afternoon when Henry goes to bed for a nap, uh, my son. and. Uh, so, so really like I'm an afternoon to early morning kind of a composer. I'll, I'll, I'll start if I can, I'll start before noon, but usually it's like, you know, noonish or at the latest two 30. And then I just kind of work from that point on. I'm just in this room trying to figure things out and mm-hmm. uh, playing instruments, trying to come up with sounds. And then I'll take a little dinner break and do bedtime with my son too. And then just get back to it. And then I'm in here again till, you know, two 30 in the morning. So I still get a full day i just start a lot later than a lot of people Mm -hmm. um if i'm lucky i can i can send stuff to other musicians but i don't often get that opportunity a lot of time it's just me in this room but luckily i've got you know i'm this is at home i'm at home so uh, my son can pop in at any time and uh, show me whatever art he just did Mm -hmm. and stuff so that's that's a really nice part of it is that i really welcome the distractions from him um, and any time that I can, I can step away and spend time with him or my wife is always, always nice. Well, he's going to be your studio assistant pretty soon, right? He's trying. Yeah. He's really <laughs> curious about all the buttons in here. Um, <laughs> yes. He loves playing the piano and singing. He's got, he's three years old, but he's got this little tiny piano book and he can play a few songs on it. Nice. Uh, and he plays, you know, Coldplay and he plays uh, some Scorpions and he plays, oh, uh, wow. he loves, he loves uh, 80s rock. I think uh, I gave that to him. Our <laughs> bedtime rock songs, you know, aren't like uh, Hush Little Baby. They're mm-hmm. uh, We Will Rock You. And uh, <laughs> I want to rock you all night and party every day. And He's jamming uh, some Quiet Riot. <laughs> yeah, Rock You Like a Hurricane and uh, Twisted Sister, I Want to Rock You. 
Um, so those are the songs that we sing every day and he's, he's very familiar with them. And so he'll play <laughs> some of those songs. You know, he learned how to do four, three, two, one, two, two on his little piano. So he can play We Will Rock You. Well, that's um, cool. That's fantastic. It's fun. Yeah, he loves coming in here and banging on things and playing things. He really wants to unplug my hard drives um, <laughs> from the dock, but I'm trying to move all those things up. But he just yeah. keeps getting taller. Well, that's cool. That's cool. He didn't run away from the piano, though. He loves it. Yeah. yeah, he loves it. I haven't, you know, tried to force him to take lessons or anything, but yeah. um, he loves sitting at it. He loves um, just just banging on it. He loves playing the MIDI keyboard too, because he can put other sounds on it. It's got built-in sounds too, so he can press all the buttons and play. Um, yeah, he loves being in here and he'll, some of his friends will come over and we'll just have a little jam session. I'll break out the little percussion instruments or a little ukuleles and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I should just record it and turn it into something. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. The next contact instrument. There you go. <laughs> you know, I had an idea that I really want to do for a contact instrument. Is I live in, in Santa Clarita now and there's like 20 different parks here. And so many of them have little musical instruments and little xylophones or little drums. And just, I like, I would love to go at early in the morning when nobody's there and just sample all the different sounds of all the different playgrounds and turn that into something. I think that could be like a really cool instrument. They're all weirdly out of tune, but there's these like big bells and there's these plastic bongos and I, I get, I have fun at these little playgrounds when I go, cause there's a lot to play. You yeah, should definitely, cool. you should definitely do that. That's a good horror instrument for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is a big question. So if nothing comes to mind, we can skip it. But the question is, what is the best advice you've ever been given? I think the, the best advice didn't come in just a phrase. It was just seeing how you can break the rules and seeing that you you're allowed to, and it's kind of encouraged and you don't have to be kind of stuck by the guidelines you learn in college. I think that experience was the one that kind of changed me the most and changed my outlook on things about there's no right and wrong. There's no, you know, there's everything is just subjective. And if it sounds good, it's good. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if you, Paired it down to a phrase, that would be it. Um, if it sounds good, it's good. But I think that the best thing is to just experiment and break rules and and you know try to make something unique. I think that's that's really good advice. And the other thing that I've been trying to embrace lately is that, especially after spending a lot of time as, as an additional composer, you're constantly writing music through the lens of what would this person do. Um, and when you're starting, you're like, what would John Williams do? What would Hans Zimmer do? What would Thomas Newman do? And then later you're like, what would my boss do? You know, what would, what would they, how would they handle this situation? When I started on Scandal, I started in season, end of season three and into season four. So the show is well-established and music was well-established and I had to channel Chad and, and write in his style and the palette that he had come up with and everything. And then when you start to write for yourself, it's, it can be hard to let go of that. What would somebody else do? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think another piece of advice is just to, to let that go, you know, have that in your brain of like what best practices are and stuff, but start thinking what would Paul Koch do and, uh, and really embrace that rather than what would some of my heroes do? Or what would mm. you know, somebody I've worked with do? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I think a big part of your sound is just having custom samples. And you were talking about the, you know, the tunings, like form in and out, the intonation going in and out and like that, those kind of hacks and tricks that you use are part of your musical identity. I, I try, you know, you struggle to like figure out what's me, you know, what's, what's my sound. And I think you just kind of do it accidentally because you, you fall into certain patterns as being a person that writes music. You, you've got certain sensibilities that you fall into and they just, over time, they become yours. Yeah. yeah I think it's the same, like with even being in a band, it's like, you know, you start off by kind of learning stuff from your influences and doing, you know, maybe doing covers and things like that. And then eventually like, your own music starts to sound like kind of like an amalgamation of like these different things. And I think it's all about just kind of like creating your own favorite thing, like your own favorite score. If you could like do a score with like all of the, you know, the things that you grew up listening to, like, and just finding a way to like uniquely mash them together. It's like, that could be your sound, you know, cause it's like all things that come from you, you know, through your lens and, you know, and that sort of thing. That's the way I always tried to explain it to people. It's just like, you know, just trying to create your own favorite band or your own, what you wish you could listen to from some. Yeah. Else. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's kind of a product of their influences and, mm -hmm. and you can listen to the same three bands as somebody else and try to write music based on that, but it's going to be different because you're pulling different 
things from each one of these bands. And yeah, it's just you you'd get what whatever resonates with you from these different places all gets put together, excuse me, put put together into one thing that's hopefully uh, pretty unique. All right. So these are a few rapid fire questions that we ask at the end. They are rapid fire on our part. They don't have to be fast on yours, but could you tell us a best recent purchase under a hundred dollars? One of the best things I got for, for logic users is by a company called speaker food and okay. it's a uh, plug search. It's called there's, they've got plug search and game control. And I can't remember how much it is, but it's maybe like 20 bucks a piece or something like that, or maybe 30 for the two of them. Mm-hmm. And it, just adds a search functionality logics plugins like a lot of other sequencers have, but you can, you just, you hover over the plugin that you want, you hit the control button and then a little window pops up and you just type in whatever plugin you want, hit enter and it loads it up for you. That has saved me so much time. I, I love that plugin. Yeah. That one's under a hundred dollars. I got a microphone for under a hundred dollars. I think it might be around a hundred dollars called the line audio CM four. Hmm. Um, it's, I think a Swedish company. It kind of sounds like, um, let's say a small diaphragm condenser. It kind of sounds like an old Neumann and it was like a hundred dollars. It's great. I use it all the time. Um, and that's really solid. Yeah. Those are, those are two great ones. Perfect. Also crumble cookies are delicious. They've got a, uh, a cinnamon <laughs> one. It's like $4 and 50 cents right now. And you can get are, a lot of cookies for a hundred dollars. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can get about 20 of these, so you can't get too many, but, uh, they they tell you the calories on them and the calories are for like one eighth of the cookie. So wow. you're like, oh, this, this cookie is this big. It's got 180 calories. Well, that's if you cut it into little teeny tiny pizza slices, which nobody will do. So they're like four, four billion calories, but they're only four dollars. So you can. Yeah, that's a good lunch. Yeah, <laughs> go. that's funny. Uh, all right. Tell us about a favorite YouTube channel or podcast or TV show at the moment. Something you've been enjoying recently. Let's see the be- the last like great TV show that I watched I think was Severance that mm-hmm. I I love that show so much it was like just checked all of my boxes of what a TV show can be with the mystery and the intrigue and the acting and the music is incredible and so I've been watching you know I just finished that kind of recently I've been watching a Japanese reality show called Terrace House it's on Netflix I okay. love it it's basically six people live in a house and they live their life and that's it. That's the whole show. They go to work. They've got their phones with them. There's no competitions, no nothing. And then eventually one of them leaves. And when they leave, they get replaced. And that's the whole show. But it's it's so good. I'm a sucker for reality TV. I like unironically love it. I met my wife through Survivor, the show. Uh, we both listen to the same podcast about Survivor. And they do like live events. And oh, wow. we managed to make friends through that. And uh, they've got a big community. And, and that's where I met my wife. So oh, wow. that podcast is Rob has a podcast um, from this guy, Rob's sister, Nina, who was on Survivor a long time ago. And uh, so that's that's a big one, too. Uh, but yeah, Terrace House has been really good. What's up? been watching Westworld. I think uh, I loved season one of Westworld. It was Same. one of my, it's perfect. It's one of the best shows of all time. Season two is pretty good. Season three kind of dipped. But season four brought me back in. I'm back fully on board the Westworld train. So <laughs> they got uh, you back. Oh, yeah. It, they got me back. <laughs> uh, so I'm really into that. And the movie is one of my favorite movies. If you haven't seen the movie Westworld, that's another thing that my first boss, John O'Brien, introduced me to. We were working one day and he just said, like, it came up somehow. And he's like, you haven't seen Westworld? I was like, I've never heard of Westworld. He's like, it's the Jurassic Park before Jurassic Park. It was written and directed by Michael Crichton. It's uh, it's amazing. Yul Brenner is in it, basically playing his uh, character from uh, uh, Magnificent Seven. And you got to see it. And so we just stopped everything and we got back, sat on the couch, put it on the TV and and watched it. And it blew my mind. So it's a movie from, you know, 1973, but that would be mm-hmm. my my recent recommendation. Mm-hmm. I'll but have to watch it. I haven't seen that. It's so good. It's, it's cheesy, but it's like amazing. Uh, my last question for you is what goals would you like to achieve in the next couple of years? What's next for Paul? Oh, yeah. I mean, just keep working. I, I, I I would love to do more of what I've been doing. I'd love to do more TV stuff. I'd love to do another movie like A Day to Die. I mean, that was such a fun experience to work on this like big action movie with big explosions and uh, real great actors. I would love to do more moon rock music. I think that's something that uh, Scott and I really let our creative juices flow. And um, that's the thing that feels like it's most us out of anything that I've done is this because it's not. You know, it's got its influences, but not from something that's on screen and you can kind of go whatever direction you want to with it. But um, yeah, no, I just I just want to 
keep working. I want to be in a place where I'm not worried about paying the bills and I still get to spend time with my family. I've got a little girl on the way. And so oh, to be able to you know, provide, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to be able to, you know, provide for the kids and, and make music at the same time. It's just, that's all I need. Love it. Uh, I meant to ask you about the moon rock thing. Did you guys do the videos yourself? We did. Yeah. Um, that was mostly Scott. Uh, he, he's got a lot of experience in video editing. His dad is a video editor. Um, okay. and, uh, yeah, so he, he made all of those, I mean, with some collaboration, but yeah, he was behind all those. And then my brother-in-law made one for one of our songs too. He shot in Ohio with his friends and he's also a filmmaker. He makes a lot of, uh, horror shorts. And, uh, so he made, he made a video and just surprised us with it. He even oh, filmed wow. me for it without me knowing we were all in Chicago and he's like, put on these glasses and then like take them off and look over there. And, uh, <laughs> and so I did, I didn't know why, but he's like, just trust me. And so, uh, and that ended up in the, in the video and it's super cool. Uh, his name's Jim Yost and you can find that somewhere. Uh, if you go to the moon rock YouTube page, it's, it's yeah. Yeah. The videos turned out really nice and they're very in depth. Like you can tell a lot of time was sunk into them. So that's why I was curious. Like, uh, it might take another five years to get <laughs> more videos going. <laughs> yeah. Our plan was to do, you know, release a song one week and then the video the next week and then the next song the next week and the next video the next week and do that. And at the end, release the album. And the last song and the last video all at once. And uh, Scott and I went to Japan in the middle of that. And we uh, we were working on it in a hotel room in Japan, trying to get it out in time. And then the last one just took a lot longer because that's the one where it's us playing everything. And it just took so much effort mm -hmm. to, there's so many parts in that song and uh, it's called Away. And just to put that together as people who uh, are not filmmakers, we're musicians primarily. And mm -hmm. uh, to put that together was a big feat. So that one got a little delayed. Uh, but the rest of it, I think, I think we stuck to schedule for all the rest of them, which was pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. That's sweet, man. Well, Paul, thanks so much for coming on, man. This was fun. We will point people to your website so they can check out your music and the band Moon Rock. Thank and, you so uh, much. Yeah. We'll have to have you back in a couple of years, see what, what you're doing then. Yeah. I'd love to be back. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was a fun chat. Right on. Craig, we'll catch you next week. All right. See you later, everybody. Bye.